Welcome to ECE302. This is lecture 3.3 on cumulative distribution functions. I am Professor Stanley Chan. Today we are going to learn about a new concept called the cumulative distribution function, or CDF in short. I know for many of you who are watching this video, this is your first time learning about this concept. So I'll make sure that you understand the idea. But I also know that many of you who are watching this video, it may not be your first time learning about the CDF. You may have known something about CDF, but you may not be absolutely clear why we need to learn about CDF. So the objective of this lecture is to introduce the concept CDF, and then I will talk about the properties of the CDF. And more importantly, I want to talk about how you can ever use the CDF to do something meaningful. Now, I want to mention that we are going to look at the CDF two times in our course. This is the first time where we, are, where we will be focusing on discrete random variables. When we go to continuous random variables, we will study the CDF again. So to start with, let me describe the following problem. Suppose you have a probability mass function with values 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. This is a probability mass function that you're given. And then we want to generate random numbers according to this probability mass function. So what do I do? Where well, I go to a computer, this is your computer, you click a button, and then this will be a random number generator. The random number generator will return you any random number in the range of 0 to 1. Uh, so when you click the button, it doesn't return you a random number that comes from a distribution that you want. And so we ask, if I really want to generate random numbers according to this PMF, how can I do that? Now, this problem could appear that it has absolutely nothing to do with the subject that we want to study, which is the CDF. But I want to show you that, in fact, if you want to solve this very basic problem in simulation, you need to use the CDF in a very clever way. Okay, so let me rephrase the problem. The problem is very simple. You are given a PMF, and then you want to generate random numbers that has a PMF following this uh, sequence of numbers. Okay, if you only use the computer, it's going to give you a flat PMF because by construction of the random number generator, it will give you a uniform distribution. So how can we convert the numbers from a uniformly distributed number into a PMF that you specify? If we know how to do that, then you can generalize this idea to arbitrary PMFs. And more importantly, you can generalize this idea to arbitrary continuous random variables as well. So, how can we solve this problem? A very interesting trick that we can apply is the following. Look at all these PMF values. You have 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. Okay? Now, what do you want? Well, you, first of all, you want to generate a number, okay, that it should have 0 0.4 chance that will lie into this bin 2, and 0 0.2 probability that will, it will land on this bin 3, and so on. So in order to do that, I want to apply a trick. It's called the cumulative sum which may not be that obvious at the first glance, but I'll explain how this can ever be useful. So we start with this PMF, 
and then we start to do this cumulative sum. For example, the first being will still have 0 0.1. Now, do not worry about the uh, the magnitude because I I, I just uh, draw it for visualization. Okay, so uh, for the first being you have value 0 0.1. Now, for the second being, the second being will be the sum of 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. That will give you 0 0.5. The third being, uh, you have 0 0.1 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2, which will give you 0 0.7. Okay, and then the bin 4, you just add all these numbers up, and then you will get 1. All right, and, and so this cumulative sum is literally just adding the numbers from the first bin up to the bin that you're looking at. Now, you may wonder, how can this simple trick ever be useful to help me solve this random number generator problem? Remember, ultimately what you want to do is that you want to allocate 40% of the samples here, 20% of the samples here, 30% of the samples here, and 10% of the samples there. How can this ever be useful? So here is the trick, okay? You, you run a random number generator that comes out from your computer, and then you know that this random number generator has to live in the range of zero and one. Now this zero and one correspond to what? This zero and one correspond to the range of the y-axis of this cumulative sum uh, plot, okay? So the x-axis remain to be the, the state of uh, your, uh, your beans, and then the height will correspond to the cumulative sum values. So now we can divide the range 0 to 1 into four segments. The first segment you will have a height of 0 0.1, the second segment you will have a height of 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. So given a point that lives in the range of 0 0.1, it might be here, for example. All right. Now, if my red dot falls into this position, then we can ask, well, can we send this number back and see correspondingly where does it go to? And in this case, it goes to bin number four. Now, how can this be useful to solve our random number generating problem? How can, how can we get to the distribution we want? Imagine that you have two data points. They all come to here, okay? And then you map back, you will see that they will go to here. But since all these red dots, they are uniformly distributed across, then certainly you will have more red dots that will fall into this range than a red dot that falls into this range. And what is the probability that you will fall into here? The probability that you fall into this range will be exactly 0 0.4 because this is the width of your segment. And if the red dot falls into this bin, then you, you know that correspondingly it has a value of 2. Okay, so this cumulative sum approach, this extremely simple trick, will allow you to pick a number randomly, uniformly distributed from the range of 0 and 1. And then do, by doing this inverse mapping, you will be able to send all these numbers into the correct bin. And ultimately, what you will get is that you will have 0.4 or 40% of the dots that would fall into bin number 2, uh, 0.2 or 20% to bin number 3, uh, 0.3 or 30% to bin number 4, 
and uh, 0.1 of 10% of the samples that we're going to be in. So eventually what you will have will be a, uh, a PMF that looks like this. If you draw 100 samples, the 100 samples will roughly have the distribution look like this histogram. Okay, so by now you can see that how we can use the cumulative sum to help us answer a very, very practical simulation problem. And clearly this cumulative sum has some properties. If I give you a PMF, and if I, if I start with a PMF, I do this uh, cumulative sum operation. Uh, I start with these, and then I will be able to get a function that looks like that. This is what we call the CDF, or the cumulative distribution function. And this cumulative distribution function has application, at least one application, in terms of generating random numbers. So we want to study more formally about the definition about the CDF. We also want to understand the relationship between PMF and CDF. And finally, we want to learn about the properties of the CDF. So this goes to the second topic of today's lecture, which is the definition of CDF. The definition of a CDF is the following. A CDF of a random variable x is defined by this notation of f x, and then you have a small x inside. This capital Fx is defined as the probability that your random variable x is less than or equals to the state x. Since we are looking at discrete random variables, this probability is equivalent to summing all the possible x primes being less than or equals to x. So how do you visualize this? If I have a probability mass function, then I just do this a cumulative sum process, I will be able to get a staircase function. So CDF is really the integration, I put a quote and quote here, to denote the summation process. Now, pay attention that the CDF is always well defined, whereas the PMF is not quite. What do I mean? A PMF is literally a delta function. A delta function is not a function because there isn't any value associated with a delta function. To get a value, you need to integrate the delta function. On the other hand, the CDF is always a well-defined mathematical object. Because it is a staircase function, it's integrable everywhere. Certainly, it has these continuities, but it's still a function. Another interesting thing is that the CDF works for both discrete and continuous random variables. So for a discrete random variables, uh, you will have a CDF looks like this. If you have a continuous random variable, which we haven't talked about yet, but imagine that you have a uh, probability distribution that looks like this, then the CDF will just be the integration of all these uh, functions. Let us work out an example to make sure that you understand how to calculate the CDF from the PMF. Suppose we have a random variable x with the following PMF. It has three states, 0, 1, and, two, uh, zero, one and 4. The probability masses are a quarter, a half, and a quarter. Now, we can plot this PMF as here. So you have states 0, 1, and 4 height 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.25. We want to compute the CDF. How do we calculate the CDF? Now the CDF should have three states. It has the same number of states as your PMF. So here we have 0, 1, and 4. 
corresponding to 0, 1, and 4 here. Now, what is fx evaluated at 0? fx evaluated at 0 is probability that your random variable x is less than or equal to 0. Since this is discrete, it is equivalent to counting just the 0 case, which will give you 1 fourth. fx at 1 is the probability that x is less than or equal to 1. This is 1 fourth plus 1 half, and so you get 3 4. The CDF at 4 is the probability that x is less than or equal to 4, and so now you have 1 fourth plus 1 half plus 1 4, and so that will give you 1. Now you can plot the CDF fx as a function of the x. In this case, we will have uh, 0.25, which corresponds to this quarter, and then 0.75 corresponds to this number, and then 1 corresponds to that number. The CDF can be calculated for any PMF. This is another example. Suppose that you are given a PMF of all the frequency of the alphabets, of the English alphabets, and it's given by this PMF. Then you can use a computer to execute this cumulative sum process. Then you'll be able to get a CDF that looks like this. Now, by looking at this diagram, you notice that the CDF has some very interesting properties. For example, it's always going up, and then we have all these uh, blue dots somewhere uh, in this plot, and we want to understand more about these properties. So now it goes to the third section of uh, today's lecture, which is the properties of the CDFs. There are several properties of the CDFs. The first property of the CDF is that it is a sequence of increasing steps. Okay, You can see clearly that the CDF is always going up. And then the CDF evaluated at plus infinity is 1 because fx at plus infinity is the probability that x is less than or equals to infinity. And this is really the probability of the entire sample space, so that would give you 1. The CDF at minus infinity is 0, because fx at minus infinity is the probability that x is less than or equals to minus infinity. This is the probability of the empty set, which is 0. At positions where this PMF is positive, there is always a jump. Now, what do I mean? We call that the example of a PDF where you have 0, uh, 1, and 4. You have these three states. How does the CDF look like? Well, we know that the CDF will have a value here. And then when it goes to 1, you will have a jump to another value. And then when it goes to a 4, uh, you will have a jump to another value. Okay. So whenever you see a positive impulse, you will have a jump in the CDF. Property number 5 says that the height of each jump is the probability that x equals to k. Okay, so you go back to this diagram here. Uh, this is the height of the PMF. And remember in our example, this is 0 0.5. Then when you jump, this height would be 0 0.5 because we are doing this cumulative sum. If you're looking at this pulse, this is 0 0.25, and therefore at 4, you will have a jump with a height of 0 0.25. 
So this is the property of the CVF. And finally, property number six says that the solid dot is always on the left-hand side. Okay, so remember that when you have a CDF, it's always a solid dot on here. Why? It's because the, uh, the CDF evaluated at a point, let's say B. Okay, this is the probability that x is less than or equals to b. Now, this is the same as probability of x less than b, which deals with anything that is on the left-hand side of b and not including b, plus the probability that x equals to b. And therefore, this x equals to b is included as well. And so the solid dots is included. Okay, so the solid dot is the probability. The solid dot shows that the CDF uh, uh, will include uh, this endpoint because of the definition that x is less than or equals to b. Okay, so solid dot is always on the left. How about the uh, the right, the right is always an empty dot, okay, empty dot on right. This is a property of the CDF. Given a CDF, we can also calculate the PMF. And here is the uh, a formula. Now, it should be pretty straightforward. Why? Because if I give you the CDF, which has a shape like this, okay, now how do I go back and find out the PMF? Because of all these properties, I know that it will have a jump at 0, 1, and 4, and so it should have an impulse at 0, 1, and 4. And then I also know that the height uh, will be given by these, and so I will, I will be able to draw this impulse with the height specified by uh, this jump. And then here I have a bigger jump, and I have a smaller jump, which corresponds to here and there. Okay. If I want to write down the equation more explicitly, then I know that this px evaluated at xk is really just fx evaluated at xk, which is this point, minus uh, fx at evaluated at xk minus 1, uh, which is this point, okay? And so when you try to measure the difference between these two values, this is f at uh, xk, this is at f of xk minus 1. When you calculate the difference, that will correspond to this gap. Let us work on one example which should be pretty obvious now. Uh, suppose you have a, PM, a CDF with a height of uh, 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 one quarter and then uh, three quarter, okay. and then uh, one, and this happens at four. Okay, so suppose this is your CDF, and remember that you always have a solid dot on the left-hand side. Then the PMF can be calculated as uh, Px at 0, Px at 1, and Px at 4, because these will be the uh, a state. And then uh, to get to Px at 0, this is really just Fx at 0 minus f x and minus infinity. So that will give you 1 fourth, which is really just this height. And now you know that this p1 is this height. So this will give you 1 half. And then uh, uh, p4 will be this height, which will give you 1 fourth. After learning all these CDFs, we also want to introduce a notation which will be useful later on. 
which is really to write the PMF as a train of delta functions. So in this case, if you are given this PMF, which is uh, Px of x, I can write it as all these delta functions, okay? And then you will multiply with a value, which is called the PMF values, and then we sum them up. So what do I mean? Uh, this is a delta function, x minus k. So depending on what the values k's are, I will have a delta function here, delta function here. So this is delta of x minus uh, x1. This is delta of x minus x2, where the location is x1, this is x2. In addition of that, I'm going to multiply this delta function uh, with a value of px of k. So for example, I have a lower value here, so this is p1, and then I have a higher value there, I have a p2. And so this entire impulse can be represented as p1 times delta of x minus x1, and then this impulse would be p2 times delta of x minus x2. So for example, uh, this is a PMF represented in using the delta function for a, uh, for this distribution, where you have 0, 1, and 2, and then you have a quarter, a half, and a quarter. So you have three delta functions. The CDF will just become the integration of the PMF. So if you integrate this thing, then you will be able to get a, a staircase function which is this uh, uh, the CDF. Now, what is the no notation of this u? This u of x is a step function, which has 0 for anything that's negative and 1 for anything that is positive. So now, if I multiply ux with 1 fourth, then I will be able to get this. Okay, so now you have 1 fourth correspond to the first one. And on top of this, I'm going to add x minus 1, and then I have a ux. And so now when it goes to 1, I will add another uh, step function, which will have a height of half. And then when it goes to 2, uh, I will need to add another step function, which has a height of 1 fourth. Okay, so overall speaking, what do you get? You get this uh, a staircase function, which is the CDF. So to summarize, we have learned some basic terminologies about the CDF. It is the cumulative sum of the PMF. Now, Later on, when we study the continuous random variables, we will also introduce the concept of PDF, which is the probability density function. CDF is always well-defined, and some textbooks prefer to define PMF as the derivative of CDF. You will see this concept very soon when we go to the continuous random variables. We've come across several properties of the CDF, and we see that the CDF of discrete random variables they are really the staircase functions. Now, this is a very important point. If you ever ask about the usefulness of the CDF, here is one possible usage, which is to generate random numbers. There are many other applications of a CDF. For example, when you try to compare the, the similarity between the two distributions, you can use the CDF as a way to quantify the difference. Why don't we use the PMF? Well, it's just because the PMF is not a well-defined function, whereas the CDFs, they are always well-defined. We will discuss CDF again when we go to the continuous random variables in chapter four. But I hope that in this lecture, you have already cleared the three questions about the CDF. One, what are they? They are the, CD, they are the cumulative sums. What are the properties? we have given you the list of properties. And then how can this be ever useful? We have given you one applications, 
which is to generate random numbers. I hope you have learned something. If you have any question, we welcome you to ask us. And for Purdue students, please make use of our Piazza forum. Post your questions there and also try your homework assignments. Thank you very much.